Put your hands together. Praying inside that prison, singing hymns to God, the prisoners listen. 
Little did they know what would come next mm. All of a sudden The earth began to quake and the foundation Of that jail began to shake the door flung Oh, open the chains of all the prisoners They came loose, oh yes they did So don't tell me what grace cannot do the sound of our faith makes the mountains move So I'm not waiting till the morning And I will worship you right now I'm not waiting till the morning And I will worship you Oh, my God. It's so good to win. 
situations going on but he's worthy now and in the midst of the situations we're making a decision in this place to trust in God we're going to declare this this morning walked through some seasons and I wouldn't choose but I would never trade them Cause they led me to you And I've been through breaking and I didn't understand But when I look back on it I see your hand I trust Trust in God, my Savior, my Savior, my one who will never, who will never fail. He will never, He will never fail. Come on, say it again. I trust in God. I trust in God, my Savior. My Savior. If it wasn't for mercy Following after me If it wasn't for all those second chances Where would I be? Cause he rushed to my rescue Anybody else? And he showed me real, 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 real love and he'll do it again and again and again and again Cause that's just what he does I trust in God oh, my Savior My Savior The one Who will never, who will never fail Ooh. He will never fail Never, 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 never fail. He will 
will never, 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 never fail. This is how I found out. I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. That's why I trust him. That's why I trust him. I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. Yes, he I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. I sought the Lord I called him and he heard and he answered. answered. That's why I trust him. That's why I trust I him. I sought the Lord yeah. and he heard and he answered. Yes, he I sought the Lord and he heard. I know that we have a God who is a way maker. Mm. One of my favorite verses to the Psalms, and it talks about the occasion in which the, the Israelites are led out of Egypt and they're headed toward the promised land, but they run into a sea, the Red Sea. They got an army chasing them, they got mountains on both sides, they got a desert behind them, they got a sea in front of them. And then this verse says, And God made a way where there was no way. I mean, no, no. I mean, no, that God can make ways you don't see. He can make ways that we can't fight. Paul says when you're going through temptations, 
Understand this, that God will always make a way. There's always a way of escape. There's always a way out because God guarantees a way. And the implication is it wasn't there. We didn't see it, but God sees it and God makes it. I don't know what you're facing today. I don't know if in your marriage, your family, your finances, or your health, I don't know what it is that you need a way to be made, but there's a God who makes ways. A God who opens doors and makes ways for us. And, and in fact, you may be seated. Uh, we're going to share communion together, which is the ultimate statement of God making a way for us. Now, I know this is not the first Sunday of the month. That was last Sunday. And we had our very special guest, Michael Jr., and, and it was great. So we didn't do communion that weekend to give as much time as we could to, to Michael and to that service. But, but we're going to do it today. And, and communion is all about God making a way for us. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the lie. I, I'm it. I'm the path. And so we're going to share communion together. Now, if you're new to Benita Valley, you don't have to be a member here to share communion because it's not about us. It's about what God has done for us. And I'm going to lead you in at each step of the way. We're going to do it together. Various churches have various styles and methods, and we're going to do it in a family-style way. You'll find the communion elements in the seat, caddy, just right in front of you. If you just take this out, and then I'll walk you through each part of this. And online, all of our family and friends, literally from all over the world, as you're watching, whatever time it may be, you can just push pause, and you can get some bread and some juice, and then you can share communion wherever you are with us here today in the house. The first tab you come to, if you'll pull back, is a piece of bread. The Apostle Paul writes on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had blessed it, he broke it. Would you break the bread with me? He said, this bread is my body broken for you. As often as you eat this, remember me. For generations, they had celebrated a Passover meal. And what he was saying to them is, it's all about me. Everything about the Passover was looking forward. And everything about communion is looking back at the event that changed everything. And he was wounded for our wounds, Isaiah says, and pierced for the things that pierce us, and he was bruised for the bruises of our lives. He was shamed, the writer of Hebrews says, he bore our shame so that you and I would never have to live in shame. And that by his stripes were made, the word doesn't just mean heal, it means whole. It means complete inside and outside. And that's what this bread is a promise of. More than a promise, it's the provision. God not only promises, God keeps his promises. And I want us to pray together. I don't know what it is that you need to have nourished in your life, but you hold in your hands a receipt for that nourishment, for that life. And I want you to pray together with me. Father, I thank you. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that he was broken for our brokenness, that our brokenness and our hurts and our hurts and wounds, and they might be healed completely. I pray for healing today of minds, of bodies, of hearts, of relationships, of families, of finances. I pray for the wholeness that Jesus died to pay for in full. And I thank you for the miracle today of not only your presence in this room, but your healing, restoring presence in our life. And we give you thanks and praise together as we eat this bread as your family, as your children. In Jesus' name, let's eat the bread together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for giving us you. Now, the second tab you pull back is the, the, the juice. And Paul says on that same night, he took the cup. Which cup? There were actually four in a Passover meal. The third of the four cups was the cup of redemption, of buying back, which is what the cup is all about. He bought us back with his own life, with his own blood that you and I might be forgiven and cleansed and included forever and never rejected. Jesus said, anyone who comes to me, I will never reject. I'll never cast away. God so loved the world. And this cup is the demonstration of that love because love is not just a word. Love is an action. In fact, in the Bible, love is a verb. It's not just how I feel. It's what I do. And so God so loved that he gave, and Jesus so loved he gave his life. And so you and I, by drinking this cup, we're simply saying, God, I receive the gift of Jesus, his forgiveness, his grace. What's so important to understand, again, when it comes to, to God's gifts, you can receive it or reject it, but you can't buy it or wouldn't be a gift. 
And so you and I just take a moment and we're going to pray together. Would you join me? Father, thank you for this cup. Thank you for the forgiveness and grace of all of our sins and all of our shame and all of our failure and all the mistakes of our life. And I thank you that Jesus paid for them once and for all. And I pray that great grace might be in this house and on every heart and every life. And we thank you and we praise you as we drink this cup together in Jesus' name. Let's drink together. Thank you, Lord. If this is your first time at Bonita Valley, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the service. If you want some info on BVCC, simply complete our online connect card. Here's how it works. Scan the QR code you'll find in the seat pocket in front of you with the camera on your smartphone. Open the link that will take you to connect card. You'll find a number of connecting options, including first time guests, prayer requests, I want some info on a Bonita Valley ministry. Check the appropriate connection box you're after. Push submit and we'll get back to you ASAP. If you're a first time guest today, please stop by Guest Central at the end of the service and pick up a special gift bag we have just for you. We'd like to take a few moments to tell you about some things coming up for you and your family at Bonita Valley. This Tuesday night, our Grief Share Ministry is hosting a special session called Surviving the Holidays. If you've experienced the loss of a loved one, this night is all about dealing with some of the difficulties the holiday season can bring. Grief Share gathers on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. in the Fireside Room of the Life Center. Fall Feast is BVCC's Compassion Outreach with our partner, Feeding San Diego. We provide groceries for Thanksgiving to those who can use some special help and encouragement this holiday season. You can help by volunteering Saturday, November 18th from 9.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. as we prepare and pass out food in a drive through style outreach. The event begins at 11 a.m. and all ages are welcome to help. To sign up, stop by the events tab at BeTheValley.com. The BVCC's Women's Annual Christmas Breakfast is back and better than ever. Join us on Saturday, December 9th at 10 a.m. at the Bonita Golf Course for a morning filled with delicious food, great company, and lots of holiday cheer. Our special guest, comedian and Christian speaker, Amy Barnes, will encourage you and keep you laughing. Tickets are for sale on our website under the Events tab on the BVCC app or at the Welcome Center booth on the patio today. Wow, just the Obedience to the command. I baptize you in the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Our next water baptism opportunity will be Sunday, November 19th at 1 p.m. in the Life Center Gym. A required baptism class will be held at 8.15 p.m. after our Wednesday night ministries in the Worship Center on Wednesday, November 15th. To sign up, simply stop by bonitavalley.com slash baptism. We believe God has entrusted us to be managers of our time, talent, and treasures. We believe he wants us to use temporary resources to make a real and eternal difference in our world. And that's what giving at BVCC is all about. When we give to God, we see lives change and transform, both others and ours. There are three ways to give at BVCC. Online at bonitavalley.com slash giving, by texting Bonita Valley to 833-303-9325 or by mailing your offering to BVCC 4744 Bonita Road, Bonita, California 91902. During our Sunday services, we offer a professionally staffed nursery that will lovingly care for your little one up to two years of age. We also offer an outdoor patio area and a family room with TV monitors for parents who choose to keep children under two years of age with them. 
Pastor Davida and her team lead incredibly fun ministries for preschool and elementary aged children in the Life Center gym. During today's service, you can take notes, sign up for events, and even give using your smartphone. Simply use the Follow the Service QR code located in the seat pocket in front of you. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us. This weekend, we continue our series from Psalm 23, Living Beyond Lack. David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I don't lack anything. Some of you remember the older translations, I shall not want. It doesn't mean we don't want things. I don't live in want, not because I don't have needs, but because he meets my every need. And that's what we're discovering, how to live beyond lack in this series. And I want to set us up for where we're going just for the next few moments. And, 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 and my question to you is, how many of you wish that you had a GPS, not just for your car, for your life? How many of you wish, like GPS, they're amazing, uh, and I've got one in my car, I've got one on my phone, I've got a couple different nav systems on my phone, uh, one of them I use is Waze, and, and, and when, I, when I pull up Waze, it says where to, and you just type in where to, and it tells you how to get, how many of you wish you had a where to, for, where do I find the right spouse, where to spouse, turn right, turn left there, uh, where do I find the best kids? How do I how do I how, make the best kids? How do I have the best marriage? How do I find the best job? How, how do I make the best decision? How do I find how do I find the best me? How do I find the best future? It'd be so cool to have a GPS for just program what you want and it tells you how to get there. You actually have something way better than that. You have more than a GPS, you have not just something, you have someone. You have a good shepherd who is not only someone who tells you where to go, he leads you where you need to go. And David says this in Psalm 23, we're going to read it together with our voices. Psalm 23, verse 3, all together, he guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. What is his name's sake? It means it's not just about us, it's about him and who he is, and what he has planned, and his glory, not ours. See, good shepherds not only feed their sheep, and water their sheep, and rest their sheep, and restore their sheep, they guide them. And David says, you are my good shepherd, and you guide my life along paths, plural. There are many paths in life, and our good shepherd knows exactly the right path to get us to exactly the right place at exactly the right time that you and I might be and do exactly what he's purposed and planned for us. The question is, how? How does God do that? How does God guide us? How do we experience God's divine guidance for our life? Because I'm going to guess that most of you have heard that before. You go like, yeah, yeah, Jeff, I know that, but I don't experience that. My people talk, God guided me. It's like, Man, my, my guidance system must not be working. Now, look, truthfully, there's, there's places where GPS doesn't work, places like called El Cajon. <laughs> Honestly, I have been in El Cajon, no service. I've been, I've been, I have circled hills in El Cajon. I was looking for a business, I never, I, I gave up because I never could find it. I, my, my nav system wasn't working. See, that's the problem with, if you've got a choice between a navigation system or a map or a compass, take the guide. Take the person who has been there. Take the person who will lead you there. How does God lead us? How does God guide us? We're going to talk about that just for the next few moments because Scripture shows us and teaches us, and there's two primary ways we're going to look at for a few moments, and here's the first one. To experience divine guidance, we must be guidable. That's the first key. God says again and again, I will guide you with my eye. I will make your path straight. I'll give you, uh, you'll hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Acknowledge me in all of your ways and I will direct your path. So all of God says, I will guide you. The issue is, am I guidable? How do we become guidable? How can I become guidable so God can guide me? Well, let me give you a, a few of the ways. One is we become guidable by surrendering. By surrendering. Surrendering what? Us. Paul writes in Romans chapter 7, he talks about his life. He says, there's things I want to do, I don't do. And things I don't want to do, I do. Anybody relate? How many of you ever said, I'm never going to do that again? Oops, I did it again. 
And I want to do that, but I don't do it. And Paul says, I have this war of contradictions in my life. I really want to, but I can't. What I can't, I do. And then Paul asks this ultimate question. Who will deliver me? Who will free me from me? Because how many of you figured out sometimes the biggest problem in your life is you? The biggest problem in my life is me. Have you ever gone on vacation and took you with you? And it wasn't what you expected because you were there. (laughs) See? So the contradiction is within us. So the key to leading me is surrendering me. It's coming to a place where I give up on me. I don't mean you don't work hard. I don't mean you're, I'm just saying when I realize I can't fix myself, I can't change myself, and I cannot save myself. Now let's just get, get honest here for a moment because someone in this room, it takes two things to surrender ourselves. It takes honesty that I really am a mess or I got messed up areas in my life, and it takes humility I can't do it. Now, there's some of us, we're not, we're not there yet. Uh, you'll never experience the saving of God until you give up on you. If you could have saved yourself, if you could change yourself, if you could make yourself brand new, Jesus would not have needed to come and die for our sins, but because we can't, he did. Communion is all about God doing what we cannot do. So we can live in ways we could never live were, were not for him. So I, I can't tell you, when I was a kid growing up, we had a song we used to sing, all to Jesus, I surrender all to him, I freely give. I surrender all. I surrender all is not just how I come to Jesus, it's how, I, how I'm guided by Jesus. A life of surrender is a life that's guided. So I can't encourage you enough to live a life that surrenders you to God, surrenders me to God, but, but, but surrendering is not just about surrendering me, Surrendering is about me getting out of the driver's seat. Now, I'm not going to speak for you, but if I'm in a car, I'd just soon drive. I really would. I'm not like, I don't want to be sure. I want to drive. Part of it is because I get sick in the back seat. But the other part is I just, I like the steering wheel in my hands. And before you call me a control freak, so are you, okay? So I'm just, you might not like to drive. <laughs> All right, I, I won't go there because I can get in trouble. There are people in the car when I'm driving who aren't driving, but they tell me where to go. Okay, so, so, so even when you're not driving, you tell others how to drive. So, so we're, we're control people. But let me show you what Jesus says to us. Watch. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Anyone who intends to come with me has to say it out loud. Let me lead. You're not in the what? Driver's seat. I am. Follow me. And I'll show you how. What a translation. You're not in the driver's seat. Okay, anybody here ever heard of Carrie Underwood? Like, like country music fans have and football fans have. Because she's the one, I listen to her every week in the fall. I do, not, not her records. On Sunday night football, she's the one who starts it out by singing, been waiting all day for Sunday night. That's her, that's Carrie Underwood, in case you didn't know who that was. That singer, and she sings that song, because it's time for football. Well, where she came from, because again, some of you may not remember, it's 2005, which is like, this is what's so sad. The people here weren't even born then. Okay, so 2005, she was the winner of American Idol. And then the first song that, that, of hers that kind of went to the top of the charts was a song called Jesus Take the Wheel. Like, 2005. It was a song about a, a, a single mom and, and, and her little one, and she puts her little one in the, in the car, and it's a, it's a cold Christmas Eve night, and she's driving to Cincinnati to see her parents. It's been a long, tough year. So she's low on fuel and low on faith, driving, driving too fast, kind of distracted, kind of, kind of weary, and, and, and she hits a patch of ice she doesn't see, and all of a sudden her car starts spinning out of control, and that's when she just throws her hands off the wheel, and she cries out this, Jesus, take the wheel. Take it from my hands, because I can't do this all on my own. I'm letting go. I'm surrendering. So give me one more chance. Save me from this road I'm on. Jesus, take the wheel. Now, some of you say, well, what happened? Because you don't know the song. So the, the second verse tells you what happened. I was, it was still getting colder when she made it to the shoulder, and the car came to a stop. She cried when she saw that baby in the back seat sleeping like a rock. And for the first time in a long time, she bowed her head to pray. 
She said, I'm sorry for the way I've been living my life. I know I've got to change. So from now on tonight, Jesus, take the wheel. Now, one of the things about the lyrics that's, that's really good, she made it to the side of the road. She made it safely. Baby, it's still alive. She didn't say, thanks, Jesus. I'll take it from here. She didn't say that. She says, from now on. Jesus, listen. Jesus, take the wheel is a prayer of surrender of me and of the driver's seat, and it's not just for emergencies, it's for every day. The, more, the Lord's prayer that we're taught to pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, is simply saying, Jesus, take the wheel of the world and of my world. Take the wheel in my life. Let your will, your ways, your kingdom, your rule, take the... If you want to experience God's guidance, you got to let go of the wheel. doesn't mean you don't have things to do, but you can't do it without him. And so I surrender. I surrender me, and I surrender the driver's seat. And for many of us in this room, that's one of the biggest struggles we face is letting go. Is letting go because there is somebody who's a far better driver than we are. He knows more than we know. He sees more than we see. And so you and I begin to be guidable. And one of the reasons that you say, well, I don't have God's guidance, because if you don't surrender, you'll never see. Seeing comes with surrendering. Now, here's a second. We become guidable by listening. Jesus says this in John 10, verse 3. The gatekeeper opens the gate for the shepherd, and the sheep, what? Ah, uh, Okay. Now, you got to listen. Okay, so the sheep do what? Listen. They listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name, leads them out, every single one. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them because shepherds in the Middle East lead their sheep, and his sheep follow him because they know his what? Voice. voice. Now, let's pause here for a moment. It doesn't say they follow him because they see him. Shepherds tell us that sheep you know, we've talked about sheep and, and, and characteristics of sheep, and, and we're embarrassingly sheep-like in a lot of ways. But one of the things sheep are not known for is they're not known for great eyesight. Now, they're, they're not blind, but they're, they don't see great distances, and they don't see real clearly. The, the phrase blind as a bat can be blind as a sheep, okay, because sheep don't see the best. Is that really you? No, so they don't really see. But sheep have exceptional hearing. They are very good at listening. So it doesn't say the sheep see their shepherd. It says the sheep hear their shepherd. Voice recognition. They hear his voice. All right, let's, let's pick it up again. They hear his voice, verse 5, but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's what? Wow, see, this is all about hearing. In fact, sheep... I already told you, sheep don't excel in a lot of things, but they're really good at this. This is where sheep sometimes are way above us. When the sheep hear a voice they don't know, they don't go after it, they run from it. They run away from voices that they don't recognize that's not their shepherd because that's a dangerous voice. Because sheep are really good at voice recognition. My question is, how good are we? Because God challenges us, if you're going to be led by the good shepherd, you have to have ears like a sheep that tune in, that dial in, that hear, that discern the voice of God. Eight times in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, that's the Gospels. Eight times in the book of Revelation, there's a hearing challenge. And the hearing challenge is this, to the one with an ear to hear, let them hear. Oh, that's a little redundant. No, no. It's saying most of us, see, you have ears on your head and you have ears in your heart. You really do. You have ears in your heart. You have eyes. Paul says the eyes of understanding. So we have ears in our head and ears in our hearts. And the Bible says that, listen, there's a difference between ears on our head and hearing with our hearts. Hearing is something we're sometimes born with, but listening is a skill. You have to learn to listen. Maybe you ever had teacher chuck, you gotta listen, listen, listen. Because you learn to listen. Listening is really is a skill, because listening's hard work. Even what you're doing now. Now, some of you aren't working enough, but listening is work. 
to stay with it, to focus, to be, to be dialed in. And so the Bible challenges us, if you're going to be divinely guided, you've got to you got to raise your listening skill, and, and, and the Bible helps us with that. Let me just give you a couple of ways. We improve our hearing by being still. Psalm 46, verse 10, God says, be what? Still. And know that I am God. You will know me when you get still. Let me try it another way. God often speaks loudest when we're quietest. God often speaks loudest when I'm quietest. Okay, come on. Ever had a conversation with someone? Well, it wasn't a conversation. You were talking to them and they were talking to you because no one was listening. Now, I can now say this because both my mother and her twin are both in heaven and so I'm safe for now. My mother and my mother's twin, Rita and Cleta, now, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> no, I got to tell you real fast. They had sisters. I don't know what it was with like that generation. This is, this is true. Back, they're like from Arkansas. And my mom's aunts, it was Dora, Flora, Clora, and Aura. <laughs> right? Scramble players. I don't know. These names. Where did they come up with these names? And the last was no Mora. <laughs> no, that was mine. I beat it. So... <laughs> That's not true. But the other, the other names were. So my mom and her twin were both talkers. And when they were together, they both talked and nobody listened. I'm telling the truth. <laughs> mom, I can say this now because she's not here. My mom would say to me, I get so, she won't listen to me. <laughs> you know, listen to her. So nobody listened. You can't carry a conversation with no. You know why we don't hear God? Because you got to get still. Because sometimes the quieter I am, the louder God speaks. He speaks in my quietness. So God says, be still. See, the, the, the truth is there's, there's, there's noise on the outside of us and there's noise on the inside of us. In fact, how many of you have heard of white noise? White noise is a really interesting sound. It sounds like this. I've got a little white noise machine beside my bed. I really just a little box. It's great. It makes this, this, this sound. And here's, here's the science behind white noise. White noise is sound on almost every frequency you can hear at the same time. And the reason it bombards you with every frequency so it blocks out other frequencies. That's why it blocks out other sounds because every sound you can hear is in that white noise. Now, why do I do that? Because I don't live in a zoo, but my backyard sometimes feels like what? Animals fighting, they're fighting in my backyard. We get skunks and raccoons. I don't know what all is back there, but they get in fights in my backyard. It's like, it's like Friday night fights, Saturday night fights. And when they're not fighting, the, neighbor, the neighbors aren't fighting, but they're partying. But they only party on Saturday nights when the preacher's got to sleep, right? So, so, so they're partying, the music's playing, and the animals are fighting. So I have a white noise machine. <laughs> so it just, if somebody breaks in, just take what you want, and, and, and I'll, I'll report it in the morning because I don't hear anything. It just blocks it all out. Some of us live our life with white noise in us and around us. And here's what happens when our life is full of white noise. We don't learn and we don't grow. That's been scientifically proven. There's a really interesting test that was done in Manhattan, New York, in an elementary school. And some psychologists, there, there was a, there was this, this building was split in half, and there was half of the students in this elementary on the one side were 11 months ahead of the ones on the other side in their learning level. 11 months. One side, of the, one side of the building was ahead of the other side. And when they studied it, here's what they found out. One side of the building was really noisy, and the other side was quieter. One side was near a railroad in New York, a railroad. This, this New York City Transit Railroad, elevated train tracks. And so the students that were closest to the train tracks were 11 months behind in their learning to the ones on the quiet side. New York City Transit installed noise abatement equipment on the tracks. And the psychologists did a follow-up study. And now both sides of that building were learning the same. Because we don't learn in noise. 
We don't grow in noise. And we live in a noisy world. In fact, okay, let's, let's, let's get just a little bit more personal. Some of us in this room are addicted to noise. You'll know because you don't get in your car while I turn the radio on. You step in your house and you turn the TV on, turn music on. I see people running. They, they got stuff in their ears. They're listening to music. Now, some of you, you drive me crazy because you're talking. I think you're talking to yourself and you got, you're talking to someone on the phone. Me, and it's like, no, it's not me. You're talking to someone. Until I was in the Hoya and I'm in the bathroom, this guy's talking away. And I'm thinking he's talking on the phone. And I realize he has nothing in his ears. So anyway, so, so others just talk to themselves. That constant noise. And the noisier things are around us and in us, the less we are dialed in to the most important voice. When our life is too noisy and too busy, we can miss what Scripture refers to as the still, small voice. Now, that phrase comes out of Elijah's life. Elijah burns out. He's used powerfully by God. He's the guy who calls fire down from heaven and all this stuff happens. And then Jezebel says, I'm going to have your head on a platter. And he runs for his life. He goes out in the desert and says, God, just kill me. I'm not any better than my ancestors and who said it was supposed to be. So he goes out and says, God, kill me. Are you glad God doesn't answer everything you pray? God doesn't kill him. God's not wanting to kill him. God's wanting to heal him and help him and use him. So God puts him to sleep. He wakes him up. He puts him to sleep. He wakes him up because a good shepherd relaxes us. He feeds us. He nourishes us. He restores our soul. And then God leads him to a mountain. So he goes to this mountain, and there, there's, a, there's, a, there's wind, and there's fire, and there's an earthquake. That's where earth, wind, and fire. No, I'm sorry. Uh, that's where they got your name. I don't have time to take you to that story, but it says God was not in the wind, and God was not in the fire, and God was not in the earthquake. In other words, God wasn't speaking in those loud things. He's hiding in a cave, and then he hears the still, small voice. The little translation is, and God whispered. And God was in the whisper. You say, come on, come on, Jeff. If God wants to talk to me, why is he whispering? I'll tell you why. And when God whispered, Elijah came out of the cave. Because to hear a whisper, you got to get close. So God whispers because he wants to draw you close. He whispers because he wants to draw you. Because intimacy, closeness is, first of all, it's, it's, it's never a community thing, which is fine. But come on, think of your dating life. And you, and you saw someone, man, I want to get to know you. You don't know him in a crowd. Hey, how are you? No, no, you, you, let's, let's, go, let's go over here by ourselves. You find a quiet place. You take him out to dinner. Because closeness is not a community deal, and it's not a rush deal. It takes the right place and it takes the right time. And so God whispers to us to draw us close to himself. Jesus says in, in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's not talking about non-believers. He's talking about believers. He was speaking to a church. And I love this phrase. And if you hear my voice, not the knock, not the doorbell. Who is it? If you hear my voice and you open the door. See, see, closeness is God's choice, but it's got to be our choice. We've got to be guidable. I will come in, and we will share a meal together. That means we'll just spend some time. We'll spend some time together. Because guidance from God takes surrendering, and then it takes listening. Because you'll never, you'll never experience the guidance of God without listening and becoming better at listening. Let me tell you how we improve our listening real fast. We improve our listening, first of all, by being still, but secondly, by being selective. Getting still, quieting ourselves is one of the keys, getting along with God, but then being selective. Whoever or whatever we listen to the most will lead and shape us the most. I'm telling you what, who you listen to the most will shape you the most. You listen to Hollywood, you listen to the news, you listen to, who do you listen to? What do you listen to the most? Paul writes this in Romans 12, verse 2, don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. It just shapes your life. Instead, watch this line, fix your attention on God. 
Paul, other places, set your mind. We choose who and what we listen to. You'll be changed from the inside out, readily recognize what he wants from you. How do you do that? Because you've listened to him. Quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of maturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. How does that happen? Because you choose who you listen to. In many ways, our hearing determines who our real shepherd is. Or I'll put it this way, whoever you listen to is your shepherd. Whoever's voice is loudest and most influential in your life, that's your shepherd. So whose voice is the loudest? Whose voice is, is the most significant in my life? How do you know? Because it's the one you listen to. It's the one shaping your life. And whoever that is, that is your shepherd. Which is why you and I need to be selective listeners. And then, and then one more about being guidable. We become guidable by being willing. You become guidable by being willing. Let me show you. Jesus says this. I want you to read it out loud with your voices on the screens. John 7 verse 17 together. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Did you catch something here? The one who will do my will will find my will. Oh, I'll find your will, then I'll figure out what I'm going to do. No, no, no. He says, if you will do it, you will find it. You know, that's counterintuitive. Yes. He literally says, see, God, God is not content to be your advisor. I'll give you some options. No, 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 no. I'm Lord of it all or I'm not Lord at all. I don't, I don't give you advice. I give you direction. And you either say yes, you get the direction. You say no, you don't get the direction. It is so important, whoever is willing will find out. Now, let me, let me, I'll give you a tangible example. There was a college student, Christian believer, ready to graduate, slips by himself into the, into the chapel, takes a piece of paper, and writes down all the things he wants to do for God, all the things he's willing to do for God, all the things he's dreamed of for God. He writes it on a piece of paper, and he signs his name, and he senses the Holy Spirit say to him, now turn the paper over to the blank side. Sign the bottom, and I'll fill it in. That's how God's will works. It's not what I'll do for him. It's what he'll do in and through me if I'll say yes. Now, why does God do it that way? Because first of all, his will is bigger and better than ours. Because we don't see so well. You not only don't see into tomorrow, you don't see into this afternoon. We don't, see, we don't see very far down life's road, but he's already been in our tomorrows. He's already been in our future. He knows exactly where you need to go and how to get there and the right path for getting there. So what you do is you just say, I'm in, and he says, I will take you there. That's how we get to where he wants us to be. Mm. But that's not always so easy to do. Because that means trusting him more than trusting me. And sometimes we're not sure we can trust him. But he has proven to us there's nobody who loves us. On the cross, Jesus says, this is how much you mean to me. Trust me. When you don't always see his hand, trust his heart, the song says. So we trust God, and, and that's how we, so, so we become more guidable by surrendering, by listening, and by being willing. That's the first key. Here's the second. We not only experience divine guidance by being guidable, secondly, we experience divine guidance, we must be flexible. What I mean by flexible is, David was a shepherd, and he guided his sheep in multiple ways, and God guides us in multiple ways. Flexibility is simply this. You and I can sometimes fall into these patterns. And one of the problems with sheep is they'll eat the same place over and over and over until they destroy it. So he moves them. And God moves us. And he moves us in a variety of ways. And one of the reasons I believe God does this is so you and I won't trust the way, we'll trust the way maker. It's so easy to trust the path. Don't trust the path. Trust the God of the path. Mm. I, I, I know how to do this. No, 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 no. It's not how I do it. It's following him. 
And sometimes he takes me in ways where I didn't see the road before. He knows things I don't know. And so there's got to be a flexibility. I know who I have believed. How he's going to get me there, I follow. Sometimes David would just lead them. Sometimes David would call them. Sometimes he vocalized things because shepherds had all kinds of sounds. One of the shepherds I was reading, he says, I had this sound for water. And if I'd make that sound, the sheep would just stampede because they knew water. That's the sound of water. They're very hearing attuned. Sometimes he would use his staff to direct or redirect a sheep. So, so let me just walk you through, and it's, it's an incredible study. It's a whole series. I don't have time for it today, and, and you don't want to listen today. But, but I'm going to just give you just, just really quick. There are so, so many ways that God leads us, but I'm going to give you just a few of the key ones, and we'll move through these pretty fast. One of the ways that God guides is through his word. He guides us through his word. Have you ever gotten up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom or maybe to go to the refrigerator because it's just, it's just you got to eat or drink something? Have you ever done that in the middle of the night and you're navigating the darkness and you don't want to turn on a light, maybe your spouse, or you don't want to wake somebody up, and you stub your toe? Ever happened to you? I'm not going to ask you what you say. <clears throat> I'm not going to tell you what I've said. Because I've done that, not, not as much in my house, because I pretty much have it memorized in my house, unless something gets in the way. I've been in hundreds and hundreds of hotel rooms. I've traveled for over eight years full time in my life, flown over a million miles. I've been in so many hotels. And, and I've, woke, I, I, I've, I've awakened in the night and it's like, where am I? And I haven't memorized how the room goes, so I have my cell phone beside me. Because either a flashlight, which I don't have, or, or, or my cell phone, and I turn on the flashlight to figure out where I'm going. Because the answer for stumbling around in the dark is turn on the light. And the same thing is true spiritually. Watch. David writes Psalm 119, 105, by your words I can see where I'm, what? Going. They throw a beam of light on my dark path. God's word literally lights up every path for our life. Now, God's word won't tell you who to marry. It'll tell you the person you should look for. The kind of person you should look for. God's word won't tell you what job to take. It'll tell you what kind of worker you ought to be in whatever job you're in. It'll tell you how, how you ought to work. You work for God and you work as under God and God always sees you so you're always working. Like, like our, our students, a couple of weeks ago, and, and, and Dan is our interim student pastor doing a, a great job and, and they're doing classes and just some really cool things are happening. And about a week ago, two weeks ago on a Wednesday night, He's having them do some projects. And so, so they showed up 20 minutes before the service and, and were students all over the campus picking up trash. That was incredible. Like some of you parents, they'll get to picking up their room, but they still start with trash at church. Like they just start picking things up. And, and just to see them out serving was really cool. And it was kind of a group thing and they're doing it. And, and then the next week, and, and I, I didn't tell her I saw this, but, but I'm pulling in and, and, and Emily, who's an assistant to our student ministries, and, and she's there and they, they were all part of this. And, but she's by herself in the parking lot. She pulls in, I pull in. She's a little ahead of me. She pulls in, she gets out of her car. She's walking in and then I see her stop and pick up some trash. Now that's not in her job description. Student ministry assistants pick up trash. But she picked it up. I saw it, God saw it. Do you pick up trash? It's not my job. Wow. Or do you say God's always watching me and I do everything as under God? I give my best to whatever I'm doing because God is my boss. And you say, well, I don't get, I don't get a raise for that. <laughs> oh, you will. Because God says, I will not only see it, I'll reward it. I will reward you in ways you'll even forget what you did, but I never forget anything you did. So he says, I won't tell you just where to work. I'll tell you how to work and how to make the biggest impact wherever you're working. God's word is full of insights and instructions for how we use our words, our time, our money, our abilities, our problems. It's full of precepts. It's full of principles. It's full of commands. It's full of promises. Real fast before we move on, let me show you how, how I was scripture with me. And obviously, reading the Bible has been a regular part of my life since I was a kid. But I read through the Bible every single year. Now, I'm not saying I read it fully every year, but I'm constantly going through it. I start in Genesis, I go to Revelation, I start again. I'm not on a time clock, though. Have any of you tried to read the Bible in a year, and you got like two months behind, and you're just flying? No, 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 no. It's not how much of the Bible do I get through, but how much of the Bible gets into me. So just slow it down. And here's how I read. And I, I'll, often for my devotions, I use the Message Bible. 
And I, I'd bring it, but the binding's broken, and, and I was going to carry it in, but you couldn't see it. But when I'm reading, and like right now I'm in Luke, and I've started in Genesis, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Luke, and I have a pencil because I will circle words. I will write. I will write, wow. I'll tell you what will happen. The God who inspired the word, the Holy Spirit, will inspire you when you read the word. And certain words will jump out at me or phrases. I go, wow, I haven't seen that before or like that before. Or, or God will talk, and I will circle something. I'll, I'll need to look it up. I'll need to think about it. It's God stopping me talking. Have any of you ever read something in the morning and you're like, and, and then later in that day, you needed that? Okay, do it because it will happen. I needed that word. And so I circle and I stop and I let the God who wrote it speak to me and inspire me and illuminate me. And I just take my time because it's God guides me with a verse and his voice. And this Holy Spirit uses the verse to remind me of the voice of God in my life. Let me give you another fast. God guides through God through good advisors. Proverbs 15, 7, only the good can give good advice. What does that mean? It means they have good character. They have integrity, honesty, truthfulness. You want somebody who will tell you the truth. Not someone trying to sell you. Not someone who's, who's trying to kiss up to you. Uh, the writer says that the, the kisses of an enemy are profuse. People, your enemies will kiss up to you. But, but the wounds of a friend are faith. A friend loves you enough to tell you the truth no matter what. Faithful are the wounds of somebody who cares for you enough to tell you the truth. That's a character person. A competent person is somebody who's good at what you're asking about. Now, listen carefully. If you need some parenting advice, don't go to someone who doesn't have kids. I'm just telling you. Now, I'm not saying they don't have good ideas. They have great ideas, and they can't wait to tell you they're great ideas. How many of you had great ideas until you had kids? How many of you knew how to have the perfect marriage until you got married? Yeah, theory and reality can be different. It's amazing how much we don't know once we... So, so we go to people who have gone there, who have done that, who have done well at that. I have a variety of advisors in my life for different areas of my life because everybody's smart and dumb about different things. So I try to find people who are smart about things that I need to, I need to learn. And the question I often ask is, if you had to do again, what would you do differently? What I'm basically saying is, what's the bad lesson you've learned that I can learn through you? If you figured out you don't have to learn every lesson the hard way, you did. So I learn from you, and then I learn other things the hard way. I don't have enough time to make every mistake. What would you do differently? People that are smart pastors will call me. I got a call this week from another church about something, and I'll tell them, well, here's what I learned. Here's the thing I wouldn't do. Here's what I would do differently. That's how we learn, by asking character people and competent people, do you have them in your life? Don't take advice from anybody. Have you seen the bumper sticker, don't follow me, I'm lost? Have you seen that? <laughs> Believe them. There's a lot of lost people telling people, no, I, I got I to hustle, I, I promise. But I, I play golf, you know that, and, and I'm, I'm what's called a hacker. So, but what, what cracks me up is I watch really bad golfers giving other really bad golfers advice. <laughs> like they're horrible, and you're listening to them? <laughs> So, so get somebody competent and get someone of character. Then scripture tells us, let, let's keep going. God guides us through personal peace. Colossians 3 verse 15, let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. We've talked about this. That word rule means to umpire. That God will give you a sense of divine order. Peace doesn't mean absence of conflict. It means a sense of divine order. And you will have this sense of order. If you have a sense of disorder, don't. When in doubt, don't. Now, sometimes we have to work through our own fears because worry is a form of fear. I got to work through it. I got to get information. But once I get information and once I prayed about it, do I have a sense of order? Paul says God is not a God of disorder. So if it feels like disorder, it's not God. He's not a God of chaos. He'll give you a sense of order. So you watch for that sense of order. If I have a sense of order, it's a green light. If I don't, it's a red light or a yellow light. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It might just be the wrong time. It might be the wrong season. I might not be ready for it. So God guides us with this inner sense of peace. Now, let me give you just one more. There's so many more. Just one more. God guides through inner compulsions. I don't know how else to say it. That's how Scripture says it. Watch. Mark 1, verse 12. The Spirit then compelled Jesus to go into the wilderness. Acts 19, verse 21. 
Afterward, Paul felt compelled. There's the same word, compelled by the Spirit. Same phrase. To go over to Macedonia and Achaia before going to Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit will compel us from the inside. That's different than the Word of God. It's different than counsel from friends. It's different from peace. There's a compelling. There's an urging. There's a sense in our heart. Now, we're always to test every method of guidance except God's Word. God's Word is always right. Heaven and earth will pass away. God's Word will never change because God has never had to change his mind because he knows everything. He's never said, oops, God's never learned anything because he knows everything. So I can always go back to his Word. His word is the anchor. His word is the rock. If I build on the rock, everything else is firm. So I've got to build on the rock. Now, one of the problems for some people is they use the rock in wrong ways. God's word is always right, but people will sometimes use God's word in wrong ways. But Paul says, test every word except God's word. Test every word. If it lines up with God's word, God's word is what gives us straight lines in our life. Now, uh, have you ever driven, like, Real fast. I've done a lot of traveling, and I'm driving, and you go by rows of corn or rows of whatever the, 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 the thing is, the, 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 the harvest. Have you ever got how straight those rows are? It blow you away. Because how many of you don't drive straight? Straight lines, it's not your thing. And these lines are so straight. And I was reading this story about a dad who's a farmer and his son, and he's telling his son, I want you to plow these rows and make them straight. Now, son, here's how you make a row straight. You get your eyes fixed on one point, one tree, one rock, one place. You fix your eyes on one thing, and you drive straight toward that. Got it? Got it. He came back a few hours later, and there wasn't one straight row. They were just like, they were all over the place. And he says, son, I I told you, you fix your eyes on one thing, and you go straight at it. He said, I know, dad, but that rabbit kept moving. Sorry, just seeing if you're with me. (laughs) If you fix your eyes on moving things, your life's all over the map. So I test it by God's word. But God will guide me with these inward compulsions of the Holy Spirit. Henry Cloud's mother did. He writes that when he was four years of age, he started having excruciating leg pains. He was raised in a little town in Louisiana, and they took him to the doctor, and He wasn't getting any better. He was getting worse. And all of a sudden, his mother has this inward compulsion. Avoid. She just, she she literally heard inside. She had this compulsion take Henry to New Orleans. Like, not to the Mardi Gras. Take take him to New Orleans. She knew immediately what that meant. There was a teaching hospital in New Orleans. We got to get him there. So they drive 225 miles. It wasn't close. They take him to this hospital, don't know anybody. They take him to a hospital, make an appointment, see a doctor. When they go in and see the doctor, he's diagnosed. Henry's four years of age, diagnosed with necrosis. Soft tissue in Henry's hip was dying. If he wasn't treated, he could be paralyzed, he'd be crippled, impacted for the rest of his life. And it just so happened that the doctor who diagnosed Henry's problem had recently finished two years of specialized training in diagnosing and treating necrosis. Coincidence? What's the chances? <laughs> do you think God knew there was a doctor, two years of training, learned how to do necrosis, sent Henry to Do you think God knows the right path for your life? The question is not, does the Lord guide me? The question is, am I guidable? Am I flexible? You have something so much better than a GPS. You have a good shepherd who knows every perfect path for your life. So how do we experience? The shepherd who not only leads us beside still waters, restores our soul, gives us the nourishment, the God who guides. How do you experience his guidance? One more time. I become guidable by surrendering. Surrendering me, surrendering the driver's seat. I become guidable by listening, by being still, by being selective. Whose voice is the most prominent in my life? Who do I dial into? Whose voice do I listen to most? Whoever I'm listening to most is my shepherd. The sheep hear their shepherd's voice. When they hear another voice, they run because that's the voice they recognize. I I become guidable by being willing. 
Jesus, if you will do my will, you will find it. <laughs> Hold it. If you will sign the bottom, I'll fill it in. So be willing. I am willing to do your will, O oh God. And then he will fill, you will be on the adventure of a lifetime if you'll say, I'm in. I'm willing. I must not only be guidable, it must be, I must be flexible because God guides me in different ways because he's the way maker. It's not just the path. Find the path, I'll see you later, God. No, I follow him in a variety of ways. His word, I follow him by, I follow him by his word. I follow him by the peace that he gives me, by the advisors he gives me, by inward compulsions of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes God guides by dreams. Sometimes he guides by doors that open, doors that close, circuits. There's all kinds of ways God guides. But the fact is, he's a God who guides me on the right paths for his name and for my best. Would you close your eyes with me just for a moment? God, the answer to the biggest needs of our lives are your guidance, your guidance, your paths, your ways for us. With every head bowed, every eye closed, just for a moment, I only ask you that to see with the eyes of your heart just for a moment and, and close out distractions and, and noises around and within. If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, that's where it starts and online, wherever you might be, right where you sit, you can simply pray this prayer. It's not a formula prayer. It just says, God, forgive me of my sin. I'm going to get out of the driver's seat. God, I give up on trying to save me because I can't. Save me. Jesus, take the wheel from this day on, and I will follow you. And his word says to as many as receive him, he gives you power to become the sons and daughters of God. Now, Father, I pray for others in this room that are right now at decision time. We make decisions every day that make us, but some are at real vital crossroads in their marriage, in their finances, in their family, in their job. And I pray, Lord, I pray that they would find you as the sovereign guide of their life. Direct their path. Direct them, oh God. And I pray that they might experience the biggest and best life because only you know the best path to life. In Jesus' name we pray.